Well, what an occasion it was after all those months of planning and speculation. I think it's fair to say that the, the coronation went off without too much of a hitch. Uh, we first glimpsed their majesties as they travelled from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey in the Diamond Jubilee stagecoach, uh, stage sorry, cheered on by huge crowds who braved the rain. Yes, it rained. Of course it rained. It's a coronation day. Uh, to show their support and to catch a glimpse of history as it was in the making. And then the king and queen, looking, it has to be said, a little bit apprehensive, made their way into the abbey. And for the next two hours, the world watched, mesmerised, as the coronation ceremony unfolded. So, Arthur, you've known the king and queen for many, many years now. How do you think they will review this coronation? And how do you think they will have felt about how those three days played out for them? I think they'll be relieved it's over, personally. Yeah. I, I, I know that, uh, you know, they, they looked pretty strained when they got to the... Um, to the balcony where I was, and uh, I felt that uh, they they probably were glad it was all over. We must give the moment to acknowledge though, how heavy those crowns are, right? Well, and we're asking five them to look relaxed and like throwing their head back, crowns. laughing. You can't. You're like this in those crowns. Mm. They are, I mean, a weight, aren't they? Well, recently I was in Germany with a state banquet there, and and Camilla wore this. Uh, tiara and she said it's most uncomfortable I mean I photographed her before she went to there so it's very uncomfortable and I imagine that was like half the weight of that that mm. crown but no they were they were they were they just looked relieved and when I looked at TV of the of the whole proceedings they were pretty tense throughout that I thought. Did you think so I mean I think understandable that you would feel apprehensive but well, do you think t tense is a, is a fair description Matt from um, where you were sitting? I wrote down in my notepad when I was watching him come down, I thought he looked like he was concentrating yeah. so hard yeah. on getting it right, doing the right thing. And I don't think he was aware of what he looked like. I think he was focused on the job. I did also write down, will he, will he smile? Because, as I say, at the beginning, it felt like a wedding. It felt like people were happy, they were celebrating. And then it became very intense when he came in because it was, it was based on, on his behaviour. But I think he gradually warmed into the ceremony as it went along. Um, the moment with William. Um, oh, then, wasn't that lovely? Uh, when you know, when William kissed him on the cheek, he, he seemed genuinely happy and said thank you to William. And there was there were certain elements in it that I thought, as 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 it as it got towards the end, I saw a more relaxed Charles. That yes, I've I've done the job. I've said the right things. This is, maybe his face was because of how just historically important it was. It's interesting, isn't it, because we are so used to him now being photographed and seen in sort of peals of laughter. Mm. He's a very relaxed man, very confident mm. uh, with the public, and yet here he was, you know, very much constrained by so much of the day, not just um, the gowns and the robes and the crowns, but the occasion. The, import the importance and the solemnity. It, it is a solemn occasion, it's, it, and, and I think, you know, for a, a man of great faith, for a man who's waited for this day for his whole life, I, I think he was absolutely as he, as he should have been, and um, you could see the concentration mm. on his face, and you could see how, how important a moment it was for him. Let's take a look at the moment where I think, well, maybe you would disagree, but this is where it felt like his shoulders dropped slightly and he started to relax into the day after the moment, of course, the king was crowned. God save the king! God save the king! Remarkable watching that back. I just thought that we'd lost sound on that clip, forgetting that it was an entirely silent moment. Mm. <laughs> Must have been quite magical in the Abbey. It was, and from where we were, it, you can see on the, on the video there that he, his back, he, he's facing the high altar and the Arch, Archbishop of Canterbury, his back is to the whole congregation. Mm. So we're all peering around and all you can see is the crown itself. You can just see the top of his head and you can just see the crowd, uh, so you see the crown going down and that's what everyone was craning their necks to see that, mm. that one little moment. And there was almost a relief that it was on, it was, yeah. it was on straight. He did, the Archbishop did have to give it a bit of a swivel, didn't he, did. to yeah. make sure it was but let's properly not forget, on. He wouldn't have been the first Archbishop to, to mess that moment no. up, right? No, History absolutely. does uh, speak of, of a few failed attempts. Um, and then, of course, we saw his Queen 
be crowned. Mm. And how, how do you think that must have been for her? Because that's a pretty big moment too. Well, if, if, if Charles was tense, I think Camilla, she did her job. She does what she always does. She's there behind Charles. She's supporting him. And then we suddenly, she looked wonderful, by the way. But it was an amazing gown, wasn't it? We, so this is designed by Bruce Oldfield yeah. for it. And so many personal details in there. They'd embroidered in her dogs, the names of her children, her grandchildren, who played huge parts on the day, didn't they? Mm. I think it was a sense of wanting to keep family close in mm. all of this. I, I've just been writing the epilogue to... To, to my book and that was the one thing that I thought you know in all of this theatre and with all of these thousands of people in the Abbey and the millions around the world you mentioned that the sense that it felt like a wedding I, I felt there was a real sense of family at the heart of this you know with the pages with the family all in the pews I mean three rows behind the royals were the Middletons and, and it was extraordinary and, and I thought family felt so central to it all and I think both for Charles and Camilla, they must have just drawn great comfort from having their grandchildren so close to them. You know, for Camilla, clearly it was having the embroidered names of her children and grandchildren and the Let, dogs in the dress. Let's just talk through, at the risk of sounding like we're on some sort of showbiz red carpet, who or what and what it all means. With the, the linen shirt, which is there to um, express humility, yes. to be humble, to yeah. simplicity, it almost looked... I mean, he looked like a, a bit bare, down. but it must it have been quite stark. a relief, yeah. Uh, for me, that was one of the most sort of stark and poignant images other than that moment of crowning to see the king sort of derobed of, of all of this historic splendor and and in in the Columbus Sindanar however you pronounce it that that simple white vestment was I, I found that really an extraordinary moment he sort of stripped back of everything almost naked but it, it underpinned so much of what he was trying to make people take away from this coronation which isn't about the people serving the king it's about him serving his people mm. and that's what that moment really spoke of isn't it Arthur? Oh, absolutely he's um he's you know he's always been that that sort of a person anyway you know doing good for others and all his life all his campaign is for others in you know those letters that he wrote to ministers wasn't never for himself it was always for others mm. he's, he's done that all his life and i you know and i've been witness things that he's done for people and uh, you never know about it, you know. I mean, every Christmas he goes to hospices, and you know I've been with him there, and, uh, and within 20 minutes there he's got everybody laughing oh, think, and yeah. happy. He's which an is, incredible which... man like that, you know. He's, he's all, all his life he's devoted to, to helping others, and uh, we we'll look at the, you know, the Prince's Trust for one thing—a million kids off the scrap heap. I mean, he's an amazing man. Let's talk about family on the day, because you said, you know, three rows back from the Royals with the mm. Middletons. Three rows back from the royals was also the king's son. Yes. And sat in that front row pew alongside William and Kate and their children were Camilla's children. Why was Harry pushed back, do you think? And was it the right call? Because Andrew was sat in the same, pretty much the same row as him. Have I got that right, Matt? Yeah, he, he was in the same yeah. row. Well, it, it, it's not a coincidence. It was obviously deliberate seating plans, you know, that would have all been overseen and approved. I mean, Harry is not a working member of the royal family anymore. But neither are Tom or Laura Parker Bowles. No, but they are the Queen's children, and she wanted them to have a prominent He's the role. King's child. He, he, he is, he is. But I think putting... Well, you couldn't have put him alongside the Waleses for the Could reasons that we all know. I think yeah. it would have been... Could that not have been overlooked? I, uh, for, for none the of state us of sitting, the none of us sitting here, nor anyone else beyond, would have been able to overlook that. It would have been impossible. So, so was this the best of a difficult situation? I do think, you think so. In terms of the seating, or should Harry have been represented as the other children of the king and queen were, as, as front row members? Well, the seating plan, was, my understanding, was actually finally agreed quite late. Um, I don't think Harry had we're told, led to believe, didn't actually have much input into it and was just, sit me wherever you put me. Um, we talk about putting them next to the whales. Is that, that I don't think that could happen. Mm -hmm. I think the Parker Bowleses were all together opposite over the other side, is that right? So they had a front row. Um, and I think that putting Harry with the, what we're seeing here, Beatrice, Jack... Um, well, he's Eugenie, amongst friends there, right? He's yeah, he's, com friends. he's going to be comfortable. So he can have little private conversations with them. He's not going to look comfortable. Well, they're not that private, are they? Because with them, them, the... the, the <laughs> Lip readers. <laughs> Lip readers then come out of the woodwork and claim that all sorts of things have been said. Um, how much weight do you put against what lip readers claim they saw members of the family say on that day? Yeah, well, I think there's, he's, he, one of the lip readers that we were speaking to said that he said to Jack, I'm feeling a bit fed up. 
but also he did talk, Harry did talk about that he's leaving straight away after the show, which he did. Mm. So, I, yeah, I mean, some lit readers might come up with, you know, see one thing, another one come, another thing. That one was inferring that he said, I'm sick of the way they treat me. Sick of the way they treat me. But the, I don't know how they could see him because yeah. for a large amount of time, Princess Anne's red plume yes. um, was obscuring his view from, from the cameras. And we talk about the seating plan. I wonder whether that was deliberate mm. um, to make sure that people couldn't actually see Harry. He was yeah. not only on the third row, but he was behind a big red plume from Princess Anne. He was also invited to the lunch that was held afterwards. So he went back to Buckingham Palace before departing to go home in time for, we have to say, his son's fourth birthday, which also a pretty important occasion. Um, it's not as important as a, as, a, as a coronation. But still important. Well, I don't think so. I think a coronation, he should have been there. His, his wife should have been there and he, his children should have been there, in my view. I mean, they're, they're, you know, he's a, he's a duke and she's a duchess and those kids are now titled. I think they should have all been there, myself. And, uh, you know, after all, he is the king's son and, 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 and it's, he's an important person. And we know that Charles toasted him, don't we, at the lunch? Um, I didn't know that, no, but yeah. I'm pleased he did because, you know, he called him my darling son. I mean, he is his darling son. You never stop loving your son, and he probably still loves his father so much. Um, I think that was... Uh, I think Meghan will regret not being there. I think, you know, all her life she could have been there. She could have been... But she didn't want to go, and, uh, and if, if it's about a child's birthday, I miss a lot of my kids' birthdays doing this job, and sometimes you have to do that. And... Uh, he, they should have been there and they could have celebrated the birthday here. You're, you're totally right and I think there were parts in that ceremony where you can see Harry looking over at the Waleses with their children and seeing George yeah. taking part in the ceremony and thinking we could have done this, you know, could we, could, we, we could have been involved in this somehow. Yeah. You could, we could have had our family here. It's not damaging to our fa to the, to the Wales to have their children there looking fantastic, doing a job, George having a role. And I think, you know... He, well, I, th I think, yeah, I mean, listen, that's one take, but then you sit down and you listen to him and he says that childhood was very damaging for him, mm. that, that level of exposure and public scrutiny. So, I mean, there's, there's two sides to, to the coin here, isn't there? Sure. Um, let's talk about William, though, because on the day... We had the first smile of the of the coronation came following William kissing his father, uh, to which Charles responded, Thank you, William. Let's take a look. I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you, and faith and truth I will bear unto you, as your liege man of life and limb. So help me God. Big moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a moment that William will entertain himself in in years to come, with his own son kissing his cheek. Um, it's that it's like staring destiny in in, in its face, isn't it? Mm. Um, what did you make of this moment? It, it, to, uh, this might sound strange saying this, but it felt a little bit like William's own investiture as the Prince of Wales as well in that moment. Because mm. he didn't have the investiture, yeah. didn't want it, but he mm. said the words he would have pledged in an investiture. Those are the words that the Prince of Wales, Charles, right? said to his case, mother at his investiture at Carnarvon Castle. <gasps> Those were also the words that Prince Philip said to the Queen at her coronation. And he is swearing to be his most loyal servant and supporter. <laughs> and I, I, um, Matt was saying that the um, um, the kiss was sort of premeditated that we did know that was going to happen. I, I wasn't aware of that. So uh, when I was commentating on this, I think I said I felt that this was such a, a spontaneous and loving moment. And the one moment where the, the king, who I think had appeared pretty tense and deep in concentration, was, understandably... It was a massive event. There was just an emotional release there and, and, and an emotional gratitude to his son you could see you know and it's not always been the most straightforward relationship between William and Charles there have been ups and downs there have been tensions along the way I don't know if it's just because of what's happened with Harry I, I think that's part of it but I think there's more to it than that that these two know that the future of the monarchy lies on their shoulders and that is a big weight to bear and they are stronger and better on the same page and I think you see father and son really on the same page and also uh, a lovely warmth between them so I really loved that moment and also who was sitting that who was standing or sitting just six feet away watching this happen was Prince George yes so he yeah. was watching very his, aware he was what he was literally standing there yep. watching William carry out this this role for his father and seeing I'm gonna have to step into the he'll shoes, be next doing that and I thought George the ultimate line of duty absolutely yeah. I, I thought George come out of his shell a bit as well really I, did. you know he's very shy up to now but I watched him at the 
at the on the balcony at the palace, and he was really in control mm -hmm. there with the other page boys, and he was pointing out. Always hangs back there, doesn't he, Arthur? That's he quite does. Interesting. Well, I didn't see it this time. I, this time I saw him positive, but um, like you know, Matt was saying, you know that 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 he was. Um, it was it was a, an important role for him, mm. but he must have been thinking one day, I've got to do yeah. this. I must remember to try it. But I think as a child as well, William had much the same disposition. He was quite tentative, quite considered. Mm. Harry was always much more of a Louis. <laughs> It's true, it's true, it's true, but I think, you know, in the same way that William always had that very close relationship with the Queen and that sort of mentoring that he had at his grandmother's knee, it's wonderful to see that echoed with George and Charles. Yeah. You see that closeness between them, and yes, so for this little boy watching, this is all part of his learning, it's part of his training. It is, like you say, the ultimate line of duty. It really is.